Uh, dear colleagues, uh, before we begin our next session, I just have one announcement from President Hugh Bailey. Uh, he extends his apologies to all of those delegates who uh, had uh, submitted questions to, to the Secretary General but were not able to make the list. However, what we would like to offer is that all of you will have top priority to ask the first questions to Yap Hoop de Sheffer uh, later in the session. And uh, just so you know who you are, and if you choose to remove your name from the list, you can do so. But uh, the top priority for the, the next session would be Diego Lopez Garrido of Spain, Jürgen Tritten of Germany, Osman Bak of Turkey, Tevan Pagosian, Armenia, Georgi Baramidze, Georgia, Mike Gapes from the UK, Georgi Oskirtsos from the EU Parliament, and Charles Huber of Germany. So if you all wish to retain your speaking rights, you are on the list for Yaphub de Sheffer. Uh, it is now my pleasure to welcome to our assembly Mrs. Mari Kivanimi, the Deputy Secretary of OECD. Mrs. Kivanimi, we are very pleased to have you here today as Deputy Secretary General of, o of OECD an organization for which we all have the greatest respect, especially those of us from Latvia who are candidates for the OECD. I hope this has some influence on your decision. Uh, you were first elected to the Finnish Parliament in 1995, and you served as Minister of Public Administration and Local Government, Minister for Trade and Development, Minister for European Affairs, and indeed as Prime Minister. In July this year, you were appointed as Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, and it is in this capacity that we hear from you today. So if I, and also if you are willing to take some questions after your remarks, uh, we'd be very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Collins, um, President Bailey, members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to be here today. And uh, on behalf of the OECD uh, and Secretary General Kuria to participate in this plenary session of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. From my own experience, almost 20 years in the Finnish parliament, I really know that people who are here are real experts in security and defense uh, policy uh, and very committed to these issues, but also very experienced uh, parliamentarians. So it's very nice to be in front of real experts today. The relationship between our organizations has become much closer in recent years. We welcome the participation of assembly members in the OECD Global Parliamentary Network meetings in Paris in February each year, where we discuss some of the key strategic concerns on the international agenda. These are important occasions for us to hear your views and to discuss with you the challenges by our economies and our societies, and to explore, faced by our economies and our societies, and to explore ways of tackling them effectively especially now at a time when geopolitical risks are on top of everyone's mind. Uh, its international and regional cooperation discussions have become even more crucial. The current situation in the global economy is a key concern for all of us. The OECD will publish its full economic outlook tomorrow, but I'm pleased to provide you with a preview in line with the preliminary numbers that we already released on 6th of November to inform the discussion of the G20 Leaders Summit in Brisbane. Despite signs of recovery, global growth will remain modest by past standards. We have marked it down almost half a percentage point lower than what we foresaw six months ago. We are now projecting global growth at 3.3% in 2014 and 3.7% in 2015. 
Global trade also remains below trend, and private investment is just idling along. 45 million people in the OECD area are still unemployed. A sobering number, 12 million more people remain unemployed in the OECD area alone, compared to just before the economic crisis. 16 million, that really is 16 million, more than a third of the unemployed have been out of work for more than a year. And this is almost twice the number in 2007, and points to structural unemployment, which will be difficult to reverse, especially as the global economy expands at a moderate and uneven pace. Youth unemployment has reached alarming levels, surpassing 50% in countries like Greece and Spain. The danger of a lost generation remains very real. While growth is lukewarm, there are also widening differences across countries. Weakness persists in the euro area core, whereas the recovery in the periphery remains fragile. Yet, the economies of the countries in the periphery are starting to bear the fruits of the important reforms undertaken over the past five years. On a high note, the U.S. recovery is broadly on track, with welcome strength in employment and investment. Growth in emerging market economies will be stronger, but is also marked by important differences with robust GDP growth in China and India, and more sluggish trends in Brazil and Russia. Again, we see substantial downside risks, some of which have increased. In particular, the growing risk of stagnation in the euro area and a revival of the emerging market taper tantrums already seen in May 2013 in light of the anticipated rein-in of the US monetary stimulus. But geopolitical tensions have also intensified in recent months, with the resurgent conflict in the Middle East and trade sanctions on Russia, which add to uncertainty and weakened external demand in some economies, especially in Europe. The International Energy Agency, a sister organization to the OECD, published in mid-November its World Energy Outlook 2014. It stresses that term oil in parts of the Middle East, which remains the only large source of low-cost oil, has rarely been greater since the oil shocks in the 1970s. The conflict in Ukraine has reignited concerns about gas security, nuclear power, which for some countries plays a strategic role in energy security, faces an uncertain future. The point of departure for the climate negotiations due to reach a climax in 2015 is not encouraging. A continued rise in global greenhouse gas emissions and stifling air pollution in many of the world's fast-growing cities. Advances in technology and efficiency give some reasons for optimism but sustained political efforts will be essential to change energy trends for the better. In order to jumpstart growth and at the same time to create jobs, we see international cooperation, including on the security front, as pivotal to face increasing and multidimensional challenges. Security, good governance, and the rule of law are important requisites to build sustainable economies. Only a safe and stable environment based on the rule of law and an efficient judicial system will allow the development of a strong, inclusive and sustainable economy. And in, in order to restore growth, our main message 
from the OECD would be that with very limited fiscal and monetary policy room, structural reforms are the only way forward to address the legacies of the crisis. But not only are we urging countries to engage such in-depth structural reforms, we are also helping to develop them, monitor their implementation, and assess their impact. And overall, our approach lies in three points. First, structural budget consolidation should be slowed down where fiscal space exists. Second, unconventional monetary measures should be maintained to keep long-term interest rates low. And there is, of course, no one-fit-for-all solution. For the euro area, for example, the persistent low growth and low inflation environment call for more macroeconomic policy stimulus to support demand. And third, efforts to ensure the implementation of structural reforms should be redoubled. We also consider trade as pivotal in pushing growth into a higher gear. Trade today is growing at half the speed necessary to boost growth. But progress on multilateral trade agreements has been limited. We need collective resolve to move forward on this front. In an increasingly interconnected world, the multilateral trading system is the key element for boosting global trade, growth, and jobs. OECD's work on global value chains, trade in value added, and on the services restrictiveness index amounts to the decoding of the trade genome and shows the fundamental role played by trade in growing our economies. But there are other options, too. Countries can make progress through ambitions and comprehensive plurilateral and regional trade agreements, like the Transatlantic, uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And the OECD strongly supports an ambitious TTIP agreement, particularly as trade is a critical element of structural reform. By removing existing barriers on goods and facilitating fairer and more transparent competition in services, investment, and public procurement, a potential transatlantic free trade agreement could provide a much needed and inexpensive boost to growth and jobs in the economies which together comprise more than 50% of global GDP, but also to the global economy. In this regard, the recent agreement on stockpiles of food between US and India is a great and welcome step forward, and it should help revive the WTO global trade deal and multilateralism as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> When working together to restore growth, governments and policymakers should have one priority, putting people at center stage. Citizens' trust is the next element to forge societies that are peaceful and inclusive. And why trust? Because trust in governments and political institutions is the linchpin of democracy. Worryingly, increasing inequality, lack of access to opportunities, and mistrust in the ability of governments to deliver policy outcomes that are fair and equitable to all are translating into a disintegration of the social fabric. According to a recent Gallup World Poll, on average, only four out of 10 citizens, four out of 10 citizens in OECD countries say they have confidence in their government. To earn back trust, countries have to rethink their economic paradigms, putting people center stage. The OECD's new approaches to economic challenges initiative, launched in 2012, represents a significant organization-wide reflection process on the roots and lessons from the crisis 
with the aim of improving our analytical framework and policy advice. It aims especially to identify a new inclusive growth model that moves away from a focus on traditional economic indicators toward issues such as access to education and skills, job quality, health status, environment, civic participation, and social connections, which provide a more accurate reflection of the multidimensional nature of well-being. And it places the issue of addressing inequality at its heart. Our research and analysis consistently points to the interlinkages between growth and inequalities of revenues, but also of opportunities. Economic growth alone can have an intrinsic negative effect on inequality. It should not be considered as an end, but a means for improved well-being. Even in well-balanced economies, technological changes involved in economic growth create a higher demand for high-skilled workers that can widen the revenue distribution among workers. But the opposite is also true. The OECD is in the process of finalizing important analysis showing a statistically significant impact of, impact of inequality on economic growth even in advanced economies. And the main mechanism through which inequality impacts growth seems to be depressed skills development among individuals whose parents are poorly educated, both in terms of years of schooling and skills proficiency. This lowers social mobility, slows human capital accumulation, and subsequently affects growth. I mentioned the importance of trust in public institutions to ensure the establishment of stable economies. I also mentioned at the beginning of my intervention the OECD collaboration with the G20. One of the areas where we put the competence of our experts to the use of the G20 is indeed on tax issues. This issue lies at the heart of our democracies and plays a central role in promoting sustainable development. Ensuring that each and everyone, including multinational enterprises, pays its fair share is key to establishing trust in governments. I'm therefore proud that G20 has mandated the OECD to take the lead on addressing base erosion and profit-shifting practices, a global problem that requires a global solution. I'm also proud to report that OECD BEPS package was one of the most important deliverables for the G20 Leaders Summit in Brisbane. These first results delivered by 44 countries acting on an equal footing, including all the G20 and OECD members, address a number of important issues. Among those, tax treaty abuse, hybrid mismatches that result in double non-taxation, spontaneous exchange of tax rulings, requirements for country by country reporting by multinationals on key indicators, as well as an agreed approach to the tax challenges of the digital economy. The report also looks forward to how we can best ensure consistent implementation of the BEPS measures. Another set of deliverables will be worked on in the course of 2015 in order to provide a full package of measures that address the gaps and mismatches which have facilitated tax planning strategies that result in double non-taxation. And importantly, we particularly heard the concern of civil society to ensure that not only the views of G20 countries, but also those of developing countries are appropriately reflected in the revamped international tax rules, the OECD launched on 12 November a new framework for enhancing the role of developing countries in the BEPS project. This deepened engagement will ensure that developing countries present their perspectives 
participate in the decision-making process, and play a role in the development of the toolkits needed for the implementation of the BEPS output. This is also a testament to the role of the OECD going beyond its membership to become a global standard body. I also want to mention that only four weeks ago, under the German leadership in Berlin, at the meeting of the Global Forum on Exchange of Tax Information, more than 93 jurisdictions, including almost all financial centers, committed to implement by 2018 the common reporting standard for automatic exchange of tax information. Mr. Chair, members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, given the presence of a number of dignitaries from the Netherlands, I want to seize the opportunity to announce that the Netherlands will be the chair of the Ministerial Council meeting in 2015, supported by the Czech Republic, France and Korea as vice chairs. The OECD Secretariat is looking forward to working with the Netherlands to ensure a stimulating and productive discussion at the Ministerial Council meeting in 2015. The ministerial meeting is organized alongside the OECD Forum, a major international stakeholder summit. Leaders from all sectors gather to debate the most pressing social and economic challenges confronting society. Some of you have participated in the past, and I invite you to attend again this year to shape the discussions on the key issues that we see ourselves confronted with. Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak before you, and I will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Kivinyemi. And uh, since we're running behind on the schedule, and five people have made a request to comment. We will cut off the list there um, and try to group this again so that we can conserve time and allow uh, our guests to, to answer all your questions. So the first three questions will go to Tevan Pogosian from Armenia, Gilbert Lebri from France, and Lord Jopling from the UK. So first of all, Mr. Pogosian from Armenia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Kiminem, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, really, I'm here. Uh, really appreciating uh, for the detailed uh, points about uh, OECD activities. I'm very glad that my country is one of the partner countries who has been cooperating, and now within the framework of the Eurasian cooperation. Armenia has been chosen out of the 90, uh, with the 90 countries to have its special case. And as I know, even today in uh, with the headquarters, there's a presentation by Armenian government on the possibilities of cooperation. Uh, despite uh, of all many illegal and unfair claims uh, towards us, we are continue to working and will do our best to do. And in that regard, my first question would be about uh, advising from your side, we as a parliamentarians, what have to really know, what have to follow to continue that uh, any obligations that Armenia would be picking up uh, will properly implement it and continue. And my second question refers to the point, as you also mentioned, about regional cooperation. Uh, on the first part of the day, we hear a lot about the need to increase for the military spending. And it seems like already for a few years uh, this uh, requirement is going on. They are count and uh, the NATO decided to make it up to 2% for the GDP. But there are countries in the world who are doing from 5 to 10 per even percent. One of them uh, could be Azerbaijan. And really uh, trying to push for the arm race instead of pushing for the regional cooperation. It would be very much interesting for, uh, to hear your opinion. Uh, what really should be done 
and what OECD could, could support to really promote regional cooperation instead of uh, spending money for the purchasing of arms. Thank you. Okay, and the next question is Gilbert Lebré from France. Madame la Secrétaire Générale Adjointe, vous le savez, l'OTAN a pour objectif que chacun des alliés... Oh, wait a second until we get... To... I understand some friends, but to make sure that I understand everything. Thank you. Continue. Okay. Je disais donc, euh, Madame la Secrétaire Générale Adjointe, que l'OTAN a pour objectif que chacun des alliés affecte 2% de son PIB à l'effort militaire, dont 20% à l'investissement, de manière que nos armées aient les effectifs, les équipements et la mobilité nécessaire aux défis nouveaux, que ce soit des défis dans les réseaux avec la cyberdéfense, que ce soit des défis avec des formes nouvelles comme ce que l'on a appris cette année, les interventions hybrides. La démarche économique et la démarche de défense sont complémentaires. Or, sous l'impulsion de M. Angel Guria, que nous félicitons, l'OCDE et le G20 sont en train de venir à bout de ce qui mine nos finances et donc notre capacité de défense, c'est-à-dire l'évasion et la fraude fiscale à grande échelle. Nous venons de constater des nouvelles avancées au mois de novembre à Brisbane. Il y a une dimension dans les questions de défense d'une autre nature et aux enjeux très immédiats, celle de la lutte contre le financement des organisations terroristes qui prétendent prendre le contrôle d'un État comme au Mali ou même, comme c'est le cas de Daesh, qui prétendent en créer un. Daesh d'ailleurs qui vise à exercer toutes les fonctions de, de souveraineté, envisage même de battre monnaie. Alors ces ambitions se fondent bien entendu sur la maîtrise de circuits économiques de trafic nombreux. Visiblement, les outils dont nous disposons actuellement, que ce soit la lutte contre le blanchiment ou les outils bancaires, sont insuffisants. Est-ce que c'est parce que nous les utilisons mal ou bien parce qu'il nous en faudrait des plus puissants Et dans ce cas, lesquels seraient nécessaires Thank you. And uh, the third question is from Lord Jopling from the UK. I, I wonder whether the Deputy Director General would uh, say a little more about the prospects for the Russian economy. And in particular, would she uh, comment as well on evidence which was given to us in a select committee in our parliament uh, only a few days ago from a former Russian Prime Minister, who, although no friend of Putin's, uh, predicted that uh, with the price of Brent crude below $80 a barrel, with the outflow of capital, uh, he predicted that the reserves uh, in Russia would run out in two years' time, and that in two years' time the Russian economy would be in a major crisis situation. Okay, thank you for very good questions. And to the first one, to Armenia, what could the OECD uh, do? And, and thank you th uh, for that, that you are pleased with our uh, cooperation with uh, us. And we have bilateral uh, projects with uh, Eurasian countries. And then we have, as you mentioned, uh, this regional uh, program. And inside uh, and in the framework of this uh, program, we try to help these countries uh, to build a uh, society where democracy, rule of law, good governance, these basic principles could be uh, fulfilled. Uh, so I would say that that is our contribution also uh, to the regional uh, cooperation in those uh, uh, countries. Uh, when we make sure uh, that these countries play with the same rules as, for example, the OECD countries, the democratic uh, uh, countries, we uh, can, by that way, also assure good uh, regional cooperation. And as I mentioned, uh, these, uh, our uh, programs, uh, we have there uh, inside bilateral and regional elements, and also these regional cooperations. Uh, cooperation gives the countries possibility uh, to learn from each other and also uh, then improve uh, the cooperation inside uh, uh, the region. 
And then <clears throat> to, to France, when it comes to uh, this challenge uh, which uh, all the NATO countries are now facing when you try to uh, re achieve the 2% uh, uh, level uh, in uh, spending uh, in, uh, in defense uh, expenditures, uh, I would say as an economist from my uh, education that that is also investment and in the long run and also in the short run it for sure increases uh, the GDP growth and the OECD's advice is that those countries uh, which have some room uh, for maneuver they should use it also in the fiscal sense to boost uh, the growth but of course every country should look at the debt level which are in most of the countries far too high so in the long run every country has to have a sustainable program uh, in uh, decreasing uh, the debt uh, level and that is especially um, uh, important uh, for certain euro countries but also for example to uh, Japan and I'm happy to uh, hear the big uh, support uh, there is when it comes to uh, the OECD's work together with G20 uh, when it comes to um, prohibiting tax evasion and, and tax uh, fraud. Uh, we are going to continue uh, that work and, and we try to proceed as quickly as possible but it's not enough that we have made um, these agreements uh, also, the implementation phase is utmost important. Uh, we have to make sure that every country also then implements uh, the new uh, rules so we uh, can um, then, that this new system is then really uh, functioning. But then when it comes to human uh, trafficking, I, I think the, the best way um, for the OECD to help uh, avoiding uh, it is the cooperation uh, and the programs which we have not only in Eurasian countries but also in MENA uh, countries, Middle East and North Af Africa uh, countries, when we are helping them to develop their societies uh, towards real democracies uh, and where principles of rule of, uh, uh, role, uh, rule of law are uh, fulfilled and good governance and so on. So I think that is the best uh, way uh, for the OECD to affect uh, uh, this uh, phenomena. Then to Russian economy, we have not published any uh, particular survey uh, concerning the effects uh, uh, of sanction uh, oil price uh, uh, to the Russian economy, but of course it affects uh, the GDP growth uh, rather heavily in certain countries. Uh, and especially when it comes to Russia, the good question is that how long does the country uh, last? As I said, tomorrow we will publish our uh, new economic outlook and there the special focus will be in Europe. So please follow our launch tomorrow. I'm sure you will get uh, more precise uh, answers to uh, questions concerning Russia. Uh, also, also there. But as I said, we don't have any any kind of specific survey where we could uh, uh, assess or would assess uh, uh, how long Russia will last. Thank you. And um, we have three last questions, and I'm going to ask all of our questioners please to restrict your remarks to less than two minutes because we're out of time and we'd like to give our speaker a maximum opportunity to respond. So first, uh, Karum Naha Petyan from Armenia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the most important issues for my country, Armenia, is its economic integration with the regional neighbors. Uh, in a region where there are many unsolved or frozen conflicts, joint economic projects and integration could serve significantly for building confidence <laughs> and as a measure to strengthening the existing dialogue. Yet there has been everything done by our Eastern and Western partners to isolate Armenia from as many projects as possible. In this regard, I would like to ask you, how the member countries of OECD and 
or its city itself could possibly have impact on breaking this geographical and economic blockade. Thank you. Thank you. And now Stephen Gilbert from the United Kingdom. Uh, thank you. Um, the Deputy Director mentioned the prospects of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership helping to uh, deliver uh, growth in the international economy. I think that's exactly right, but there, I think, is growing resistance across Europe to the TTIP negotiations and a growing scepticism about what governments are trying to achieve uh, with TTIP. And I think I'd seek her comments on what more can be done to persuade an ever sceptical European public that TTIP is part of the answer to delivering the economic growth that we want to see. Thank you. And the last question, uh, Nalahat Ibrahim Gizi from Azerbaijan. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairman. And uh, using opportunity, I would like to express my thanks to our Armenian colleagues because I am very thankful for him, he following Azerbaijan increasing development. Thank you very much. And dear colleagues, as regards the statement of the Armenian MP, I have to say that only the educational expenses Azerbaijan make 24% of the Azerbaijan budget. Health expenses and other fields have been allocated big money. 2015 European Games are under preparation in Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan tries to build its arm according to NATO programs like IPAP, PARP. Therefore, we have to envisage this in the military budgets also because we have been subjected to war and military operation by Armenia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Okay. Thank you for the first Armenian question when it comes to what member countries uh, could do to improve the situation in, in your region. And, and I think that is the uh, question which member countries of the OECD are best to um, answer. But as I mentioned already in my first uh, answer, so what we can do is, uh, are these uh, regional uh, cooperation programs and also bilateral programs. That is our uh, answer to improving the situation in every single country. And also because these programs also are do done uh, in cooperation with all the countries, I think that is one uh, tool which, which could uh, then increase the understanding uh, of uh, every uh, country towards uh, other uh, countries. And then uh, to UK, when it comes to uh, TTIP, you, that really is, is true. I'm also a bit uh, concerned about the situation when it comes to negotiation, the, uh, negotiating uh, the TTIP agreement. And the best thing the OECD uh, could do is that we deliver our surveys, uh, our research results, which very clearly show that everybody benefits uh, from uh, the uh, liberalization of, of trade. There's actually no uh, survey done which would uh, say um, that trade liberalization harms uh, the GDP growth. All the surveys concerning same countries show the same results, trade liberalization um, increases the GDP uh, growth. And that is actually the case also when it comes to um, uh, multi-country surveys uh, since 2000. Uh, all the surveys uh, done uh, concerning more than one country show the same uh, results. And uh, there's a lot of data and a lot of uh, uh, surveys uh, from our side which we could uh, even better communicate also to the members of parliament and then uh, uh, also to, to media uh, to uh, show uh, that um, in the long run uh, no country uh, benefit uh, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, making it impossible to liberalize uh, uh, trade. But I, I know when it comes to the details, the question goes to investment, uh, investor state dispute settlement. So that is one uh, question that then uh, which have to be discussed uh, among the European Union uh, member countries. Should something to be done to that system uh, when it comes to, for example, tran transparency? 
And then the question from Azerbaijan. I mentioned in my in my speech uh, that uh, inequality has uh, negative effects to the GDP growth. IMF published uh, last uh, spring a survey which very clearly showed this, and as I said, we will uh, publish in a um, couple of uh, weeks uh, surveys will, which uh, tell the same uh, story. So in that sense, every country should look at not only the means how to make GDP grow, but also to look at the inequality, because in the long uh, run, it really will harm the GDP growth the, and the overall uh, well-being of uh, citizens in every country. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, although you've only been in your job less than six months, you obviously have a handle on, on all the topics, and we really appreciate you being here. So if we can Second please give our months. speaker. <laughs> Now I will turn the chair back over to the President.